Greetings. I'm Vince Staley, Executive Director of Media Impact Funders, and I'd like to welcome you all to our Media Impact Forum. In today's program, we're going to hear from some amazing storytellers and activists. As usual, the first hour of our 90-minute program will be devoted to expertly moderated uh, presentations and discussions, followed by 30 minutes of questions and comments with all of you. At any point in the next hour, you are welcome to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and then we'll come back to you at the end to invite you to present your question or comment. In the meantime, you're in great hands for the next hour, as I'm uh, going to turn the program over to Caitlin Yarnall, who will lead our program today. As you can see in the program, Caitlin is Senior Vice President at the National Geographic Society and also Chief Storytelling Officer there. Now, Caitlin is also a board member of Media Impact Funders, and she recently was elected Secretary of the board. Um, so I guess you could say she's also the Chief Storytelling Officer at MIF, although that basically entails approving minutes of the board meeting, um, so that's not really quite as illustrious as her day job. Um, anyway, later in the program, Caitlin will be joined by Tim Isgett, who is also a member of the board at Media Impact Funders, uh, and also he is Managing Director at Humanity United. I'd like to thank Tim and his colleagues at Humanity United for their generous sponsorship of this forum. As well, I'd like to thank the Skoll Foundation for its sponsorship of this uh, program. And it's particularly fitting today because uh, we know that Skoll Foundation is particularly committed to great storytelling and we're certainly gonna be getting a lot of that today. So Caitlin, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. And, and thank you everyone for joining and um, that's quite a setup. Um, expertly moderated is a high bar, but we're going to do our best. And really, I have the easiest job today because we've gathered some of the best storytellers and activists here with us, um, some of whom I know very well, some of whom I'm just learning about their work. And um, it's really just exciting to dive into this work as we talk about ways that the human story layers with the environmental story. So first up, um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to my friend and National Geographic fellow, Pete Muller. Pete's a photographer, researcher, journalist, author, and his work focuses on masculinity, conflict, human ecology, and oftentimes it's centered in the intersection of those spaces. And today we're thrilled to have him share with us part of his body of work on a topic called solastalgia that I'll let him explain to you all. And this work was recently published in the April edition of National Geographic Magazine with Pete contributing both the images and the words. So Pete, I'll turn it over to you now. Great, great. Um, well, thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, I assume that everybody can hear me. Um, yeah, as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Pete Muller. I'm, uh, I've been a contributing photographer to National Geographic magazine um, for the last several years. And for, I guess, the last two and a half or three years, I came on as a National Geographic Society Storytelling Fellow. Um, for, I'm, I'm going to start sharing with you some, some images as I, I, I share some things about myself. Um, for, um, right, for, for, for the last 15 years, I have been um, pretty deeply dug in on a lot of social anthropological photographic pursuits, most of which were kind of based in my initial research interests, particularly in issues related to war and conflict. Uh, I've always been strongly interested in why outbreaks of armed violence arise. Um, it's always such a complicated analysis to figure out precisely why conflicts spill over from sort of conflicts of social discourse and narrative into instances of armed violence. I've always wanted to understand these things um, better. So I, I was based in East and Central Africa for, uh, from 2008 until 2019, um, covering instances of political unrest and, and armed violence, instances like this one. This, this is an image that shows uh, soldiers from the National Army of the Democratic Republic of Congo firing artillery uh, in the direction of one of the largest uh, rebel movements in recent, recent history in DRC, the M23. Um, this image was taken on the outskirts of the city of Goma, which is the regional capital of, of Eastern Congo. This was part of a larger body of work that I was working on about 
uh, the underlying causes of, of conflict in Eastern Congo, mineral resources, scarcity, inter-regional -re political um, aspirations for control of those resources. And ultimately, I did a, a sort of explanatory component of this that examines notions of masculinity and how they were driving factors of, of conflict in the environment as well. Masculinity has been a kind of consistent theme uh, in my work over the years. Um, I, I worked on a larger explanatory reporting project um, about this that was published in National Geographic's 2017 special issue on gender. Um, this is an, an image from that project. This was a, an, an exploration of mostly of cisgender heterosexual masculinity for the most part, how young men and boys are incul inculcated with the kinds of ideas that give rise to their understanding of themselves as gendered creatures, uh, you know, as their, their interactions with other people, um, and, and particularly how those, those types of instances in, of, um, in my own interest occasionally intersect with, um, with notions of, of violence and some of the more disturbing aspects of masculinity that so many of us are hoping to uh, to rectify if we can. This is another image from that project, a young boy named Drew Moore standing in his bedroom. Uh, this was about a component that dealt with the tradition of hunting. Uh, this is in Mississippi and, and, and Arkansas. And all of this work, as Caitlin mentioned, is tries to be largely intersectional. It's, it's often cross-regional. It's like... Um, my Okay, I wasn't sure if that was on my end or if it was uh, uh, on the, the source that, that P Pete Muller was using. So it looks like we had a, a technical freeze uh, from Pete's location in New York. Um, and uh, Caitlin, uh, do you want to uh, uh, say maybe a few words about what Pete's work um, was trying to accomplish while we hope to reestablish with him momentarily? Yeah, I will. I'll just say a couple a couple words, and if Pete comes back in, that's great. If not, um, maybe we can move on to the next segment and bring him in at the end. Um, yep. Sorry, he's texting me. I'm just going to jump in. So Pete's work really looks he's at back. here. He's he is back. Sorry, New York City. No okay, I was no pretending problem. to be Pete. He's back. Oh God, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, where? Okay. Um, you were at the Arkansas image, Pete. Okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. It sounds like this seems like my my connection is is um, is unstable. Um, right. So so you know I, I wanted to. Uh, this is this image of this boy Drew Moore. Um, this was a component that I was doing about the tradition of, of hunting in, in Arkansas and how historically, of course, that had been something that was male dominant. Um, and Can you to... share your screen again, Pete? Sorry. Oh, my goodness. This is not. Okay, is that, is, that, can, is that visible? That's perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Um, right, so, so this was a component of that story that we were working on for the special issue of, of National Geographic on, on gender. Um, 
And so, so all, you know, this type of approach, this sort of cross regional uh, ethnographic, visual anthropological storytelling has always been the sort of centerpiece of my approach to my, to my photographic work. And I really wanted to bring that type of, of, um, of methodology to the really pressing conversations that we've been having about the environment. I really wanted to examine the human dimensions of that. I think we'd all agree for the most part that an organization like National Geographic has been a standard bearer for a long time in December disseminating information about the physical changes in our world, all the science that's gone on that explains the changes that we're seeing and begins to give us some sort of anticipatory judgment about the path ahead. But, but I, I really wanted to try to flesh out what that means for, for people, for the, for the human story. Um, and I, I, I spoke with Caitlin and others and was fortunate to receive a National Geographic Fellowship to begin to explore the, the social, human, emotional, psychological story of, of experiencing major forms of environmental transformation because it seemed like something that was perhaps missing a little bit from that subject. So I'd like to take you through a little bit of how I chose to approach that, uh, that complex conversation. This is, a, this is an image of, of the Upper Hunter Valley. It's this incredibly beautiful bucolic river valley that's about three and a half hours north of the Australian city of Sydney. And for most of its modern history, the, uh, the Upper Hunter Valley has been known for really uh, scenic, wonderful, positive things. It's been a, a, one of the mainstay industries there had been the, the breeding of thoroughbred horses, wine vineyards, citrus groves, alfalfa fields, all of this kind of, of typical rural bucolic positive things. Um, but in the late 1980s and accelerated in the early 1990s uh, was, a, was a massive discovery of high quality coal underneath the valley floor. Uh, there was a rising global demand for coal at that time in the markets um, and the Australian government along with international partners decided to start massively exploring it and, and companies came in and they started to dig big, big holes um, to get at this uh, this coal holes like this one this is the uh, this is the Mount Thorley Walkworth mine and it's in a shire that's called Singleton uh, in this area of the Upper Hunter Valley and it's it's a gargantuan hole it's visible from space it's kilometers long kilometers wide it's about a thousand feet deep um, at its deepest place and uh, you can see a little bit on the right side of this image some cars this was taken with a drone um, uh, above the mine. Uh, you can see the cars give us some sense of scale as to how massive this mine is. And they started opening up mines like this all throughout this quiet rural place. It, it didn't take long for this pace of exploration um, to begin to have noticeable impacts for the people who, who live there. Here you can see a former farmhouse uh, right on the edge of a, of, a, of a large open pit coal mining um, facility and behind it is what's known as overburden. Now these are like layers of rock and earth that have formed over the top of the coal seams uh, and open pit coal mining is the process of removing all of that overburden, transferring it to a different place so that drag lines can then come in and harvest, uh, really exhaustively harvest all the coal that's in those seams. Um, obviously this makes a massive transformation of the environment. As you can see here, you know, there's, you have a Huge amount of taken out of one place so it makes a hole a massive hole where there wasn't a large you know embankment where there wasn't in, in addition to this there's huge amounts of dust noise and uh, and light pollution furthermore there's a social transformation that happens in that lots of new people who are coming in to work temporarily in the mines who are less invested in the community begin to come the changes in the environmental changes in the place drive a fair amount of the residents who had formerly lived there away so there's also a considerable transformation of the social tapestry of the place. Now this is, this is a man named Glenn Albrecht. And uh, Glenn is, is an environmental philosopher. Um, and at the time that the expansion operations were really happening heavily in the Upper Hunter, Glenn and some of his colleagues became particularly interested in the social impacts that these mines were having on the, on the inhabitants who lived around them. And Glenn Albrecht was particularly interested in the emotional um, and psychological impacts that these, that these mines were having on the residents. And, and as the mining intensified and the operations in the mines themselves expanded, word of Glenn's interest really began to spread among Valley residents. And the phone in his office uh, began to ring frequently. And on the other end of the phone were, um, were people like this woman. This is Wendy Bowman. Uh, 
Um, Wendy is now in her 80s. She's a near lifelong resident of the Upper Hunter, part of a, a, a large dairy farming family there. She's maintained a, a, a farm there for the better part of 50 years, deeply connected to the place. Um, and Wendy was beside herself with this incredible sense of stress and, and discomfort. Uh, she was involved in really protracted battles with mining companies, trying to keep them from expropriating various parts of her property to expand the mining operations. She was serving as a community activist activist on behalf of other people who were in similar situations and her role was constantly expanding you know ultimately she was serving as a informal marriage counselor and personal mental health counselor for all of these people who were undergoing this massive form of of of, of mental and emotional stress she really couldn't sleep these this situation was on her mind day and night glenn got calls from people like john lamb who we can see here on the right side of this photograph in his car. John is a, you know, is a, is a sort of a tough older guy who comes from the, the generation that believed that emotional and psychological distress was really the domain somehow of, of the weak. And he thought that his mental fortitude and outlook would carry him through whatever adversity uh, might happen. But, but more and more, uh, as, as these mining operations really churned this valley that he was incredibly connected to, from beautiful green fields that he'd known into these gray sprawling pits like you can see here on the left, something inside of John Lamb really began to change at an emotional level also. Whenever he found himself driving into you know, proximity, visual sight line of these mines, his heart would just drop into his feet. He started driving sometimes 30 or 40 or 50 kilometers out of his way just to avoid seeing these, uh, these massive transformations of the place that he loved. He, he and his wife both began to take antidepressant medication to contend with the, um, the psychological state that they found themselves in as the mining intensified. Now, Glenn Albrecht, uh, the philosopher, began to hear a lot of these types of stories. And, and Glenn started to notice a certain commonality among many of these stories. Um, it was as though people who, who he was talking to understood very clearly that the minds themselves were the source of their distress, but many of them had a very difficult time succinctly and clearly explaining how precisely it was that they felt about this transformation that they were witnessing. It was almost like they felt a, a, a sense of, of homesickness. It sort of to be the closest approximation that Glenn and, and others could, could identify. But of course, that didn't entirely make sense because nobody had left home. Really, the complicating factor in this description was it was sort of like homesickness, but, 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 but people were where they belonged. It was as though some, their homes or some essence of their homes had instead left them. It wasn't really a concept for that, nor was there any kind of corresponding word to explain that concept in short, in short order. It certainly wasn't a feeling of nostalgia um, because it wasn't really just about pining for, for better days gone by that were lost to the sort of inevitable progression of time as change in our lives is, is this inevitable force. This was really about something, this key feature of this place that gave people such a sense of comfort, being taken or lost in the present. So it was an active emotional sensation, which had implications both for how people thought about the past and how they foresaw themselves and their story evolving in the future. As far as Glenn Albrecht could tell, there really was no way to succinctly express this feeling that he was encountering among so many people in the Upper Hunter Valley. So Glenn sat down with his wife and his intellectual partner, Jill, who we see here in this photograph in their home study in their library, and they decided together, what we have to name this feeling. So many people are experiencing it. There seems to be consistent features of it. There's no way to express it. And without a way to clearly express this feeling and have a sort of collective acknowledgement of what it was, people were at a disadvantage. So they started to think very critically in, 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 in a sort of synthesis type of way of what exactly was underway in the valley. What was, what was at the root of this con consistent feeling that they were encountering among people? Well, they knew plainly that there was a, a pain, a, a sense of distress or pain or longing, like a, an, an algia, like nostalgia, the pain to return, as it was originally coined in 1688. But this pain, this algia, really pertained to people's homes and their sense of connection and belonging in a place. 
And they thought, okay, well, well, what do our homes at a very base level give to us? And they concluded between them that our homes at a fundamental level give us a sense of comfort, a sense of kind of refuge from things that might be troubling us otherwise. And, and, and with that agreement in mind, Glenn sort of struggled to figure out, well, how could he make a new word to name this feeling from this agreed upon idea that comfort is a central part of it, longing, algia is a central part of it. How could he, how could he modify this? He was struggling. So they took out this book of synonyms and antonyms that Jill had from her days at school. And they looked up comfort in that, in that small book. And there they found a, a synonym for the word, solace, from the Latin root solacium, to have a sense of peace. And Glenn thought, I think that I can make that, um, that work. I think I can adapt that to be a new term to describe this feeling. So in an academic paper in 2003, Glenn Albrecht began to refer to this complex sense of a loss of sense of place, the sort of homesickness that you have while you're still at home as solastalgia. And it's, it, 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 as Glenn initially defined it, it's this sense of emotional psychic distress that some individuals feel as they live through perceived negative transformations in their, their home environment. But it's sort of bumper sticker definition is this sort of homesickness you feel at home as a result of, of environmental transformation. And people, when Glenn introduced this idea, people started talking about it. The sort of internet, circles of the internet went alight. Uh, people started making art about it. They started writing academic papers. They started convening conferences. So there were all types of synergy happening around this unusual, interesting word to describe a feeling that evidently resonated with people, not just in this case study where he coined it in the Upper Hunter Valley, but it seemed to be resonating far beyond that. In fact, I discovered the term solastalgia as I was watching a National Geographic documentary film that was independently produced and distributed by National Geographic, I think in 2015, that was about water shortages and droughts that were increasing around the world. And this particular film was focused on, on droughts and water shortages in California. And they reference this concept to describe this experience that seems to be expanding and more prevalent in people's lives as climate change, which is changing things as we know beyond political boundaries and, and borders that we know is in, in, a, in a global, has the capacity for global change. And I thought, this is a really fascinating new frontier of charting and understanding and identifying and naming things that pertain to our changing relationship with the environment around us. And what interested me most about it, that it wasn't, it didn't pertain solely to uh, the changes that are happening outside of us in the world, which places like National Geographic have done historically such a good job of chronicling. This pertained to how those changes are being mirrored back within us. And what interested me so much about it is that without a sort of agreed upon concepts and words that name those concepts, particularly things that are internal. All of our emotions, of course, are experiencing, experienced at a purely internal level until we are able to express and share them. And without terminology to do that, we are unable perhaps to connect and see the true scope of, of impact that uh, environmental change is having through the world. So I set out to interrogate this idea further. I spent time in, in Australia with Glenn and I started to travel in these comparative, with this comparative case study model to various places that were undergoing varied forms of environmental transformation, like a place like Paradise, California, which experienced the most deadly wildfires in state history in November of 2018 with the campfire that burned over 90% of the structures, displaced tens of thousands of residents, killed uh, almost 100 people. I spent time with people like Gwen Norgren, who we see here sitting next to the pool of a house she formerly owned uh, in Paradise, California. Uh, and this was a place that was deeply rooted in her sense of identity. She brought up her, her children here, her grandsons were here. Um, you know, she used to come out through these double doors that she'd built, this the home that she built with her late husband. She used to dive into the pool, float on her back, look up at the blue California sky under these swaying pine trees and really fe felt this profound sense of, of comfort and connection at this place. I spent time with Don and Debbie Criswell. Uh, Don, Chris Well is a sixth generation Paradisian. His family had been um, in paradise for, for many, many years. And, and, and uh, in addition to his professional work as a private investigator, 
uh, Don is, plays, plays the piano and he played, he was sort of part of the social tapestry of, uh, of Paradise, California. And then he played music all over town, including at the Rocky Mountain Smokehouse, which you see the remains of on the left side of this diptych photograph. Um, he was devastated by the loss of the smokehouse and all the other places, the churches, the lodges, all these places that he used to contribute um, to the sort of subtlety of atmosphere in paradise. We talked a lot about community, about the loss of built, built systems, built structures that facilitate um, our sense of interaction and what it was going to take to try to regain some of that, um, that feeling and connection. After that, we traveled high up into the Peruvian Andes to attend an annual celebration that's celebrated by multiple nations of the Quechua community, the indigenous community that occupies not just that part of Brazil, but a number of other um, contiguous South American uh, states. And each year, members of these Quechua nations make a pilgrimage up um, into this particular valley to a, to a series of glaciers where they celebrate a festival that's called the Coyoriti Festival, the Snow Star Festival. Um, and it marks the beginning of the Andean New Year. Um, and it's, it's, it's thought that the Lord of Koyuriti resides in these glaciers that are rapidly receding. They've lost a considerable portion of these glaciers that used to descend far down the mountain in years past. They recede more and more um, each year. There used to be a tradition among the, uh, the festival goers, the observers of the Koyuriti Festival, to cut off parts of these glaciers that are thought to be imbued with medicinal healing properties that are, that are, in st that are bestowed into the glaciers by the Lord of Koyuriti, but as the glaciers reside, re rescinded farther and farther, that practice was stopped. Um, it was extraordinary to be with the, some of the orchestrators of, of the festival to hear about its history and the role that some of the environmental features that we're now seeing transform so profoundly play in our stories about mythology, uh, religion, and how, that, how those elements, of course, play in strongly to our sense of, of identity. We worked uh, also high in the, in the Russian Arctic and the Chikotka Peninsula, uh, in particular in a, a small sea mammal hunting town called Lorino, uh, where members of this Chukchi uh, coastal sea hunting community have, are, have been and continue to be almost entirely reliant on the, uh, the harvesting of marine mammals for, for sustenance and survival in a place that otherwise does not uh, facilitate any agricultural cultivation, virtually nothing grows in this place, so the community's well-being is entirely tied to their ability to successfully hunt migratory um, sea mammals. In this case, we see a Chukchi sea hunter uh, successfully throwing a harpoon at a Pacific walrus. Um, this was taken uh, during the summer months, uh, during, as, the, as the summer, which of course is a, is a very short window in this far north of the Russian Arctic, is part, they, they see the migration of gray whales that move up from uh, far, southern reaches of Mexico on their migratory route um, up into the, the northern reaches of, of Canada um, through this patch of the Bering Sea and the Chukchi Sea. Uh, and of course, as we know, the Arctic is warming at a considerably faster pace than others. So there's been considerable transformations in the ice-based ecosystem that tends to um, define how coastal communities can hunt uh, during the winter months along the coast. They're entirely heavily reliant on um, this formation of what's called Kromka, which is coastal sea ice that often historically extended out perhaps 20 kilometers uh, from the coast over the last three years. There has been no formation of sea ice. So this is a complex, uh, creates a complex sense of, 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 of transformation Form transformation, not just in terms of the practicalities of hunting, but the identity and the practicalities of surviving. Um, finally, we, we worked um, uh, along the Gulf Coast of Louisiana uh, an, on a small island that's come, become sort of a, a hallmark case of land loss. This is a place called Aldejan Charles, uh, and Aldejan Charles has lost 98% uh, of its land mass due to coastal erosion, rising sea levels, the digging of, um, of resource extraction and navigational canals um, by, by heavy industry, um, and has eroded you know, considerable, considerable parts of this place, uh, which used to provide bountiful hunting grounds, agricultural grounds for the community that, uh, that lives there. This community has since received uh, the first ever relocation grant from, from the HUD, 
um, to, to ultimately change the community's location from the island, which has almost in some ways become uninhabitable because of the increase in sur storm surges uh, and the fact that there's no longer any land there uh, to be able to defend the inner, the inner habitated areas of the island from these storm surges. I spent a lot of time with a woman named Chantelle Commerdale, who we see here um, in this photograph seated at the dinner table uh, of her grandmother's house, who's her grandmother, Denise, is sitting in the foreground, her father, Boyeau, and her three children are there. And uh, Chantel spoke at length about the emotional experience of losing um, this place and what it meant for her and the community around her. And I'd like to give her the chance to kind of share in her own words here, which is often what I was doing is collecting extensive um, audio uh, interviews of, of people for their, for their own reflections. Going through this process, we've met other uh, communities and there's a community in Alaska who's had the same thing. And we were able to sit down and talk about things. And it was almost exactly the same feelings, the same emotion that they went through. It was an instant, it was like, oh, okay, so I'm not alone. I don't, this isn't just something I'm making up in my mind, you know. It was, it was real. It became real. I was really very interested in um, Chantel's remark that it became real. Um, and, and it became real in part to her because she realized that other people felt it too. Um, now she was in a somewhat unique position and that she was able to close this geographic distance with this other community in New Talk, Alaska that had experienced such profound coastal subsidence and land loss. But for most people who are experiencing considerable forms of environmental degradation, those meeting points are, are just not possible. And it left me thinking that words and terminology and, and things that signify our common experience through these things are ways of connecting people. Um, when, when those types of sort of in-person physical uh, distances can't be closed. You know, we are at a fundamental level, we are social creatures and we have a deep, strong abiding desire, not only to understand our own experiences, but to make sense of them in a broader continuum and understand that we are not alone in this. Um, and I, I think that Glenn Albrecht's attempt to give language, new language, to identify some of these increasingly prominent uh, human emotional experiences that accompany the changing world that we're living in is a really fascinating, important endeavor um, that we ought to give a little bit more conversation to. And I think, interestingly, I think we had an opportunity to get many of us, those of us who are not living on the front lines of environmental transformation, had a little bit of a window into what it's like to have an environment surrounding you that no longer um, facilitates your normal activities. It's sort of transformed into a hostile space. And so I did a short um, sort of exploration of my own experience uh, during this period of quarantine that's just gone by over these last three and a half months where ultimately an, uh, a component of our environment, in this case a pathogen, didn't cause drastic transformation to the phys physicalities of our landscape, but its presence transformed the ways in which we were able to interact with that environment. Um, and I think many of us would say that the world outside of our door uh, since the beginning of COVID no longer brought us that same sense of comfort and familiarity that it once did. We've had to really try to understand how we're going to operate in an environment that has, through this period anyway, not supported um, the types of things that we are accustomed to. So I, I thought it was sort of interesting to explore the concept of solastalgia as a prominent sort of human emotional experience in the context of this universally experienced transformation that so many of us have now gone through um, through COVID. So I added a sort of additional chapter of that to this recent, uh, recent work. So that's it for me. Thank you, Pete. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And um, I, we already, I already see a question or two coming in for you that we'll tackle at the end of this conversation. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for, for bearing through our, our technical difficulties there as P comes from one of the largest cities in the world with maybe the worst internet. So um, Pete, I'll ask you to stop sharing your screen at this point. And um, I'll now introduce our, our next segment. Um, I'm thrilled to have Michael Primo and Vic Barrett with us. Um, Vic Barrett is a democracy organizer for the Alliance for Climate Education. He's coming to us from Madison, Wisconsin, and he's 
currently um, working on a big effort to get young people out to vote. Um, but Vic was also part of the young, group of young people who sued the government in Juliana versus the United States. So I'm thrilled to have Vic here with us. Um, we also have Michael Primo, who's the executive producer at Storyline and an accomplished journalist, filmmaker, and artist. Um, Michael was one of the early pioneers in the field of participatory filmmaking. And he's also coming to us from New York City, hopefully with better um, internet. And so welcome, Michael and Vic. Pete. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Vic. Um, Vic, since you're, you're up on my screen, I think we will um, start with you. I, I really am interested in hearing from both you and Michael, but, but about your origin stories. How did you get into this body of work? And, and I'm, I'm thinking, knowing you a little bit, that uh, Pete's, the concepts Pete's talking about certainly resonate with you in your origin story. So I'll, I'll let you take that, Vic. Yeah, um, yeah I, I got involved in the movement my freshman year of high school. I was 13, 14 years old. Um, Hurricane Sandy had just happened the year beforehand, um, and I was meeting so many young people on the ground who I had been impacted by the storm. My school had shut down. I remember being terrified. I had never experienced anything like that or thought I would in <laughs> New York, but um meeting so many of my other peers of color, especially my black and brown peers, and hearing their experience on the front lines of Hurricane Sandy, I just realized it was an issue I couldn't ignore knowing that people who look like me were being disproportionately impacted by storms like this. Um, and also at the same time, Black Lives Matter was kicking off in a big way. Um, it was right after Trayvon Martin had gotten shot. It was in the midst of the uprisings in Ferguson. And I was just realizing that we have these super storms like Hurricane Sandy and they disproportionately impact people of color and put us in um, the line of fire. And then we have these systems like police, like police who also do that to people of color. And I was just realizing that there was a lot of front lines that black and brown people were on. And there was not just one front line that black and brown people were on. Um, and so I decided to kind of make the issue that I cared about um, most climate justice, because I couldn't ignore the fact that the people who are the best stewards of the earth, indigenous people, black people, brown people, are the ones that have the earth turned against us by um, systems of power, and we're the ones that get put on the front lines of environmental disasters that are perpetuated by a climate crisis that we didn't contribute to in the same way that more privileged communities have. Um, and I guess just having all those thoughts swirling at such a young age, at 13, at 14, um, and also knowing who I am and where I come from, being Afro-Indigenous, having a family that's right on the front lines of sea level rise in Honduras, um, it, just, it just felt like something I absolutely couldn't ignore. Uh, and that's kind of how I've been doing this work for seven, eight years now. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for sharing, Vic. Michael, I'll turn to you. Um, we won't make you go all the way back to when you were 13 or 14. I wouldn't want to do that. But um, I, I know Superstorm Sandy was a, was a turning point for you as well. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, uh, always a pleasure to be with you guys um, talking about these questions. Um, you know, I have, I have a uh, sort of a multidisciplinary background and I've worked in a lot of different mediums and I've worked, um, you know, as a photographer, I've worked in theater, uh, I worked for StoryCorps for a while making stories uh, for that national broadcast. Um, and I've always been interested in this question of how do we uh, rethink our relationship to the people formerly known as the audience? And what does it mean to sort of also um, in this vein of thinking about, um, you know, building healthy and dynamic democratic societies? What does that mean? What does that involve? And how can we sort of bring those same um, ethos of civic and community engagement to the process of media production of art creation? And so what does it look like uh, to really sort of engage in collaborative processes? Um, a lot of times it's sort of a hard thing um, for folks to wrap their head around, um, particularly when we just see the outcome. We just see maybe a film or we just see maybe a radio story or a photograph. But how do we rethink and re-engineer the steps and processes that got us to the point of creating that piece? And so, you know, I had been involved in, um, in um, creating work 
almost coincidentally that we're dealing with lots of different uh, systemic crises over the years. Um, and then, uh, you know, had been involved in, in um, doing work, um, both sort of organizing relief efforts and documentation and uh, reportage after Hurricane Katrina. So um, when, when, you know, Hurricane Sandy was making its way up the coast, we were sort of instantly sort of thinking, um, very um, acutely how this moment, this natural, this particular national disaster was going to shed a light as all sort of acute crises do, how they shed a light on systemic uh, inequities, on systemic problems that um, these individual events really allow us the unfortunate opportunity to be able to sort of really dig into um, because they expose the systemic inequities, right? And so um, when Hurricane Sandy hit New York, uh, we did two things. One was we started this project called Sandy Storyline with uh, about six other people. It was, it was part of our sort of core group initially. And we were really interested in how, rather than just us making a film or a, um, an audio series or um, uh, photographs, how could we create a way that anybody who was impacted by this event could share their story? And there was two kind of broad categories that we engaged our you know community of journalists and artists and other sort of community folks who are engaged in all sorts of type of work to participate. One of those ways was people could participate, uh, could contribute stories um, in the form of radio, written stories, audio, or film. And then the other way that people could participate was as sort of producers um, actively helping us build out the infrastructure and the architecture to be able to facilitate all of these pathways for engagement with the story. Um, and that really made for this like rich mix of experiences that were coming together in these really exciting production meetings um, with people who had wildly different varying degrees of experience with actual media, but they were recognized as experts in their own lived experience to bring to bear um, their perspectives of how we could create a project that would engage all these people. The, the outcomes, the sort of visible outcomes to community, to, to the outside world, were um, a website um, that had these sort of interactive stories that evolved. Uh, you know, it, I think it went up the week after the storm and slowly evolved for the subsequent five years afterwards. Uh, we, and we had live installations that were a mix of video, audio, and photos. And with um, you know, technology that was sort of, um, this was like right before VR became a thing and we were engaging with these sort of um, interactive technology that allowed pe participants to the ex exhibition to contribute photos that they would text to the project and then, you know, instantly they would become part of these sort of three-dimensional installations. So the, the installation was, was, was constantly being created by the participants, right? Um, and this is a, th these are activities that are um, uh, very resource uh, intensive because they're process driven. But in the sort of context of a disaster, there was a lot of people really interested in being able to volunteer their labor, um, their creativity and ideas to create this project. Um, and, you know, it was really a great way, and I had been involved in many different sort of like collaborative participatory projects before that point, but, it, but because of the sort of, um, the um, anxiety of the navigating disaster, um, we really learned a lot about, around how to create uh, processes in a ways that are reflective to sort of uh, people's um, sort of emotional journey through a crisis. Um, which was really, which was really important, and it sort of uh, fed um, and informed a lot of our thinking for subsequent projects. Uh, one of those projects, subsequently, was a project called Water Warriors. Um, I'll put a link in the chat eventually, so you can see that the uh, it's a short film and uh, photo exhibit which has been touring. Um, and the uh, photo exhibit, the uh, the photo exhibit was touring a variety of spaces that ranges from museums to community-based spaces, um, like community art spaces, as well as uh, powwows um, um, on the sort of powwow circuit, right? And then the short film you can see now, uh, it's broadcast. Um, it was on TV last fall on PBS, broadcast by POV, and it's still streaming um, in the U.S. and Canada uh, on POV's website. And so Water Warriors was this uh, community that was not a community that I'm not from, uh, this indigenous community, um, which was faced with this um, very difficult uh, question of how to protect their water in the face of, um, of a fracking company that had come to explore for natural gas. Um, 
And so they set up a series of blockades um, on the road um, and subsequently were able to successfully impede the progress of this company so much so that they built this multiracial coalition of, um, of white families and indigenous families who came together um, and across sort of 400 years of conflict to be able to like find a common, a, a common goal. So why don't we watch the trailer? I think mm -hmm. we have it queued up. We can yeah. watch the trailer. And then Vic, I'd love to hear your reactions. Mm -hmm. Water is the gift of life. Nothing in this world can live without water. This is disrupting the natural flow of the aquifers underground, for one. There's no doubt about that. I couldn't know what I knew and not act. Every day people were waking up and they were like, how am I going to fight today? Listen to the beat of the mother and of the drum. We are all warriors and we are here to protect. They're not going to stop. Neither are we. We have to fight for this earth because there isn't another one. This is the only planet that we have. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that with us, Michael. And, and, and for those of you who haven't seen the film or been able to see the exhibition anywhere, please do check it out. It's, it's, it's very powerful. Um, Vic, I'm thinking about you and, uh, you know, something Michael said about how do you document and, and fight against the systemic problems while in the middle of an acute crisis. And I think about your work around climate justice, but then specifically what you're doing right now um, in, in democracy building. How in your brain do you balance these competing or are they competing? Mm -hmm. um, issues of the acute yet the very chronic, both of which need attention. Yeah, I think that's a, something I've struggled with, you know, even just being an environmental activist for the amount of time that I have been and kind of going in between these spaces of doing very local organizing at home and then also going to like the World Economic Forum or speaking at the UN General Assembly and taking these things that, like you're saying, acute and systemic um, and things that can seem separate, especially right now, I feel like um, with everything that's happening with the uprisings around the Black Lives Matter movement, I've been thinking a lot about these systemic habitual issues that we have in our systems. Um, and I actually read a tweet the other day that I thought was so interesting, where it's like people don't really people misunderstand what systemic means. They think it's, they still think it comes down to the individuals within these spaces. But even if you were to take out every racist individual, these systems are still made to act the way that they do. Um, and I think that kind of the way I've come to terms with that is kind of what I can control in my own communities and with the people I see right in front of me. Um, and seeing also just how like instances of the acute um, what they can create. I think what I saw a lot and what Michael was even showing or what he was talking about um, or with that woman in the video who said I could just no longer ignore what was going on. Um, and I think that these instances of the acute create leaders. It creates people who want to step up and do something to address the systemic. Um, I think that, you know, the the little localized lessons of what was going on in New York City is what propelled me to be able to realize the global injustices that come with climate change and that come with um, that come with racism. I think that I, I think also particular young activists are really are really good at kind of looking at the acute and looking at the systemic because we have all these interactions online where we get to talk about the acute that we don't even see really um and, and kind of build it into the broader narrative of what's going on and the systemic narrative of what's going on and make those connections um so yeah I, I think that kind of spoke a little bit to what you asked me 
Thank you. And unfortunately, we're going to move on um, to the next speakers. We're so jammed for time, we could have an hour with mm -hmm. each one of these segments. But um, everyone tuning in, please think of questions you may have for Michael or Vic, and we'll, we'll circle back um, in just a few minutes. But at this point, um, as we transition, we have another trailer um, for an exciting project called the Outlaw Ocean that we're going to discuss next. So can we have the trailer, please? I think of the ocean as this space that has been kind of a metaphor for freedom. And it still is that. You know, it is a place that people go to escape rules and escape government and escape other people because it's so expansive. But those very allures of the space are what, what has made the ocean a scary place. Don't take photos, don't take photos. So I have to put the camera down. Few places on the planet are as lawless as the high seas. The ocean is a place of amazing beauty, but it's also this dystopian realm where severe inhumanities occur and often with impunity. What you realize when you're in that void or in that expanse is that most of that space is ungoverned and ungovernable. There are few laws and what laws exist are murky and overlapping and contradictory. Laws are only as good as their enforcement and the enforcement mechanisms for any of the laws are anemic at best. You have human trafficking, sea slavery, abuse of stowaways, weapons trafficking. When the UN looked at it in 2009 and they interviewed Cambodian deckhands, over 50% of them had witnessed murder. A lot of the forced labor that end up on these fishing boats are trafficked migrants and are very poor and easily taken advantage of. One mariner summed it up as this line of work is like jail with a salary, except the salary is not guaranteed. We in the West would, would like to think that things are progressively getting better, and in many ways they are. But in, in this space, things are arguably getting worse. Over 99% of crimes that occur out there go unreported. And there's not a huge point in reporting them because it's never clear who would actually do anything with that information. I think if there's anything to be learned about human nature from the outlaw ocean, it's that we all have this visceral capacity to behave in ways that we thought civilization had stamped out. There's a vanishingly thin line between civilization and the lack of it. And I think the exploration of this frontier is an attempt to look at how thin that line is and what's on the other side. Well, that is quite a trailer for a book. Um, and at this point, I'd like to welcome Ian Urbina and also Tim Isgit um, into conversation. Um, Ian, we'll get to him in just a second, and I think um, he has, you know, quite the walk-on reel there, so we don't need a big introduction. Um, but Tim is a fellow board member of mine for Media Impact Funders, and his day job is he's the Managing Director of Humana United, and um, he has contributed to funding part of Ian's Outlaw Ocean work. Um, Ian is an investigative reporter, National Geographic Explorer, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about the project and what's next. And um, Ian, I really want to hear 
how you would weave together some of the conversations we've just been observing into your reporting. But first I'll start with the big why. Why, why the ocean? Why, why focus there? Um, I think a couple of reasons. One, I was on staff at the New York Times for 18 years, 17 years. And um, as a journalist um, up until a year ago, and as a journalist, I think you're always, especially as an investigative journalist, you're always looking for, you know, virgin snow, you know, topically. And, and you're looking for stories that um, offer the potential to say new things or package old things in new ways. And uh, the two thirds of the planet that's water, you know, kind of emerged at the, as this ripe frontier for storytelling. Um, and then, you know, before uh, becoming a journalist, I was an anthropologist and I think that is relevant here just because uh, in some ways, um, the um, attraction to the ocean was um, as much about the interest in the diaspora tribe of people, the 56 million people that work out there from whom we rarely hear much, and yet they're essential to our economy, to our existence. So anthropologically, um, I was especially drawn to the space uh, because it offered the chance to um, talk about um, an otherwise largely invisible people and um, also to sort of explore stories at the intersection of human rights, labor, and environment. So for all those reasons, it just was a gift that kept on giving journalistically. Yeah, and you did most of this reporting while at well on staff at the times correct um so the, we're going on year seven now and the first two years um was a series that ran in the paper and then i took two years off um, much thanks to humanity united and other funders um, to produce the book and then now we're a year on top of that um post the book um so it's an even portion times non-times but did you think originally, was this, a, was this always a book in your head? Was it a series of articles for the Times? Was it going to be your, your life's work? I want to know, you know what, how you started thinking about it and where you are in thinking about it now. And then I'm going to turn to Tim. Yeah, so um, I, uh, when I was working on my dissertation, I ran away from it and took a year off and um, worked on a ship. And that was my first introduction um, to the space. And then ultimately when I got hired by the Times, I harbored this ambition to get the gray lady to pay to send me to sea so I could land that story that I never got to really tackle anthropologically. Um, and then when I finally found an editor who was willing to take the leap with me, um, her name is Re Rebecca Corbett, um, I had kind of three ambitions in the body of it. One was methodological in the sense that I wanted to do long form narrative, explanatory, sort of polished investigative storytelling, you know. Um, but I also wanted to try to do it differently in the sense that I really wanted to get out into the space and tell these stories with eyeball, you know, kind of firsthand five senses type writing. Um, and uh, not attempt to do these things remotely, call them in on shore, interviewing deckhands and the like when they returned. And then the other sort of big ambitions um, were topical. I wanted to reimagine the space. I mean, the space, that two thirds of the planet, that's water, had long been sort of thought of in literature and journalism as this kind of um, almost a watery desert that you fly over. Most of us landlubbers fly over and, and no one's out there and there's marine life, but you know, it's just mares container ships and that's about it, some fishing vessels. And I, I wanted to um, blow that definition up and show to folks that this is actually a vibrant, well-populated, bustling frontier and largely ungoverned, ungovernable maybe even, but generally extra legal space. And there was a vast diversity, and that was the other goal topically of things happening out there, sort of expand the taxonomy of understanding of the, the species of activity and players that are out there, not just BP spill or Somali piracy, but also sea slavery and, you know, arms trafficking and murder of stowaways and, um, you know, illegal dumping and, you know, a, a range of illegal whaling and all sorts of other things happening out there that are riveting. Um, so those were some of the ambitions. Yeah. And, and Tim, I'm wondering as a, as a funder, 
and all the need in the world. Why Ian? Why this project? Um, what, what attracted Humana United and you to it? Yeah, thanks for the question, Caitlin. Um, and I want to also just thank Michael and Vic, um, Ian and Pete, uh, for sharing their work with us today. Um, I'm with Humanity United. Uh, we're a human rights focused foundation. Um, and I would just also, it's great to be part of the program, particularly this program on climate justice, um, because as we know, so much social human degradation and exploitation in the world is intimately intertwined with climate uh, environmental degradation, um, exploitation, climate justice. So thank you for, for having me. Um, part of our theory of change as an organization is that we believe that you have to be aware and you have to understand human rights issues. It's sort of the first step to addressing them. So we've, we've spent a lot of time over the last decade supporting media um, around these issues, specifically journalists and media outlets who are interested in shining a light on the systems um, that contribute to the abuses of human rights and dignity in the world. Um, and thanks to both Michael and Vic for talking about the systems earlier. Um, we've also worked over the last decade on the, on the really specific issue of forced labor on Thai fishing vessels. And I think it was about six years ago, maybe Ian contacted us um, knowing that we were working on this. He started talking about his series for the New York Times. Um, and he also let us know that he was interested in, in writing a book and just appreciating, appreciating Ian's dedication to um, the sort of issues of lawlessness and inhumanity at sea, um, in addition to his capacity as a storyteller, clearly, we provided him a sort of modest grant to, um, for the development of his book. I think what we didn't appreciate at the time, or maybe perhaps couldn't have predicted, is that Ian's work would continue in the way that it has. And I think he's gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, uh, and I would just make this note as a funder too. I think we often make investments to have impact. And Ian is such a terrific example of um, sort of unanticipated impact and reach. Uh, we funded a book and it's become so much more than that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Tim. Um, Ian, so what is the more than that? We'll we'll start being coy here. Tell us tell us what you're up to now. Um, well, I mean, at 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 its root, um, the more than that is built on a foundation that is the same um, that it was at the beginning. You know, um, and it, and it must stay true to that foundation. And what I'm referring to is. Um, I left the Times, um, uh, became a contract writer so that I could publish in the magazine, but um, created a nonprofit called the Outlaw Ocean Project um, with at its root, the foundational ambition of producing four or five, six major high gloss, you know, kind of tier one level investigative narrative stories. And that have the same methodological ambitions that I cited originally, get out into the space and talk about the range of concerns that all add up to a general lack of governance at sea, be they labor, be they human rights, be they environmental concerns, and give life to the 56 million people out there who are doing this work. Um, but it starts with storytelling, you know, and really told in this rigorous, polished way. And then the other ambition um, that I carried with me into this new endeavor was, um, to try to innovate um, in the, the methods of distribution. So one of the frustrations I had, you know, I only ever worked for the New York Times and have nothing but wonderful things to say about it as a journalistic institution. I think it's one of the best around. Um, but the Gray Lady is a slow moving sort of um, um, uh, um, entity. And um, when it comes to innovation and distribution, how you ensure that the investment in a story gets seen, and also even innovation in translating that story into other mediums, other products, um, that was one place where I was um, frustrated creatively. And I wanted in this new chapter of my professional career to really lean into the um, attempt to innovate in distribution. Because I thought, you know, if you're going to drop a half million dollars on a, on a series over the course of 24 months um, and, 
you know, you probably should think about not just running single 4,000, 5,000 word stories, but think about a whole slate of other things that you'll do from the same core material. So in, in my case, the innovation and distribution sort of front of what I have been doing um, has lots of aspirations and different chapters, but the most, the first chapter of it was taking the, the reporting um, and uh, teaming up with musicians around the world, be they classical, ambient, electronic, a, a diversity of different musicians in different genres, um, and attempting to um, recruit them to engage with the stories in two different ways. One was, I think of as a top-down way, which was uh, this classical soloist uh, pianist um, would read the book and feel um, an emotional connection to specific material within it, up to them what, um, and then write music that attempts to, in that different language, tell these stories, their language of music. That's the top-down sort of emotional relationship, interpretive relationship. The bottom-up relationship is, um, it took the, the five years of reporting and stripped from it um, rich uh, sound. And the sound is either ambient or prose. So the sound is either, there are two different archives of field recordings. The ambient is textured sounds like machine gun fire in Somalia or chanting Cambodian deckhands on the South China Sea. That, that's ambient textured sound. And then the other is the prose archive, which is Secretary of State John Kerry at the UN talking about the reporting or interviews I've done or other people talking about characters, interviews even with individuals in the reporting. Take this collection of sounds and the bottom-up relationship with the musician is put that um, ingredient bucket, if you will, at their disposal and ask them if creatively they feel motivated to use those sounds in the music. Ultimately, what they produce is this five-track EP. We put out um, uh, an album. We put the music out and uh, publish it in a standard way that you might digitally, not CDs, but um, uh, Spotify, Pandora, Sirius Radio, et cetera, YouTube music. Um, and the play here journalistically is, um, number one, th th there are almost four experiments going on at the same time. One is the creative experiment. It's this experiment in translation, um, in, in moving from words to music. Um, the second is a sort of experiment in distribution in the sense that if my 16-year-old son doesn't read the New York Times and New Yorker, and when I publish there, um, how do I get stuff in front of him, into his head? And same thing with readers in Australia that might not see stuff that I'm writing for these US focused venues. So the thought there was from a distribution play, why don't we go to where they are and where a lot of people are consuming a lot of information on our, our on alternate platforms like YouTube and Spotify. And so the distribution play was bringing our content over pairing it with the music, making a music video that talks about the footage, having interesting back-end explan explanations as to what this music is about as an alternate way to get at people in a different way and at different people. Um, and then the, the other two experiments are, you know, um, the notion of social change and driving social change through journalism. I'm a journalist, not an advocate, but I do have an agenda. I want people to, through my storytelling and explanation, um, understand this realm better and then have an informed way of making decisions about how to fix things. Um, and I think the social change experiment here is um, using these alternate platforms and the translated versions to um, uh, um, roll out the reporting in a longer runway and have people, more people, but over a longer period of time consuming the stuff. And then the, the last experiment that I'll shut up is, um, there's an experiment in funding. You know, everyone knows, especially in this room, like that journalism is um, struggling in terms of financial models and, and relying on the generosity of Tim and, and Nat Geo and Humanity United um, is amazing, but not a sustainable um, from a journalistic point of view plan. And so I'm trying to figure out alternate ways to monetize the journalism and the reporting. You know, if, a, if, if I'm paid $8,000 by a magazine to produce a story that costs $85,000, I got to figure out some way to close that gap. And the, the music model um, has a streaming revenue source. It's pennies, but it adds up when you do it at scale that funds all the money we make goes directly back into the nonprofit, which funds new stories. And so that's the other experiment here. And then just to, to, to sense, initially I had planned on doing this with four artists. 
right as of last week, we had uh, 415 artists from 90 countries, each artist producing a five track album um, that will be producing 50 albums every two months, releasing them for the next 20 months. Um, so it has grown to this massive thing. And what's really exciting about that is the collective listenership and even eyeballs on Spotify and these other platforms between all those artists is 80 million. And that's more than eyeballs at the, you know, the New York Times in a year. So there is really something really exciting about all the experiments that I think may actually work. It's, I think the scale is hard to comprehend, right? <laughs> um, how, and I know we want to pivot to questions now, but um, Tim, I'm wondering if, as a funder, as you listen and, and we've talked about Ian's new models he's putting forward, how are you thinking about different funding models or, or are you just, you know, or is being the seed to someone like Ian enough? Yeah, I mean, um, that's a great question, Caitlin, and a tough one for us. We're part of the Omidyar Group ecosystem of organizations, and um, our specific focus is human rights. Um, what we haven't focused on is the is the business model for journalism. And Democracy Fund, Luminate, others within our ecosystem are really hyper focused on on the business model for journalism. For for us, I don't know if this is answering your question, but an investment in um, Ian is as much a, an investment in the content that he's producing, in this case a book, as it is in the individual himself who's working on this. This is his life's work now. Um, and I don't know, you know, where it's gonna go, what it's gonna do, but we are, we're taking a, a bet, we're taking a risk by investing in, in Ian. And, and <laughs> to put it in financial terms, I guess in this case it paid off, um, but he's been, <laughs> uh, no, but like, you know, we invest in a, in a number of storytellers and journalists, um, film, investigative journalism, just over the gamut, just to raise awareness of these issues. Sometimes it, you hit a home run. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't work, but that's, that's the business we're in. I, I just, that was actually mainly a question for me and just some, you know, self, self-soothing uh, <laughs> conversation among friends. But um, thank you, Ian, so much for sharing uh, your project and where it's going. And I see that um, Roshni has already put the link to the Outlaw Ocean music project in the chat. So everyone make sure to check it out on Spotify. Um, and also, if you haven't read the book, do. It's captivating. Um, it's amazing. So at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Vince. And um, we already have two questions in the Q&A box. And I think one ended up in the chat as well. So Vince, over to you to yeah, that, ask a question. Thank you, Caitlin. That was so fascinating. And I, I realize we're past two o'clock when we say we're going to move to Q&A, but we're actually pretty flexible about that. We really just view it as 90 minutes of discussion. And so if the discussion is rich, we're happy to uh, benefit from the, um, the extra innings of, uh, of, of great programmed content there. I want to see if uh, John... Funabiki is going to join us in the um, in the discussion here because if he wants to ask the question himself, he can. Um, but if I don't see him appear momentarily, I'll I'll ask it for him. Uh, let's see. Well, so I'm I'm going to go ahead and, and jump in here and ask it. on behalf of John. Oh, wait, there he there he is. He's arriving. And he just has to take his microphone off mute. So hi, yes, thanks. I, I didn't realize we would have this opportunity. So uh, this is absolutely terrific. I lost some of the transmission. I was out. Uh, my my internet failed as well today. So maybe this is a national trend. Um, I was very curious about Pete's work, um, and there was a lot of, of focus on uh, GT. You know, these really almost disastrous kinds of events, right? Um, um, whether it's climate or uh, natural disasters, but it seems to me that a lot of the emotional tug that we were talking about could also apply to gentrifying neighborhoods, because you hear this time and time again across the country here, but in other countries as well, where 
there's just this rapid gen gentrification that that disrupts established neighborhoods, uh, disrupts the history and the culture and the, and the people um, who are living there. And I'm just wondering if that might also fall into this um, category. Thank you. Um, sure. Uh, everybody can hear me. Um, yeah, that's that's it's a great point, and it's it's arisen. You know, when I whenever I'm presenting this work, I always feel like it's important that I. Um, that I say that you know I have added to some degree to 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 the the essential thinking that's been done by Glenn Albrecht on this subject. I mean, this is really his his intellectual framework that I was doing some sort of investigation about because I think that it's interesting. And certainly, that question has been posed to Glenn on a number of occasions, and he would absolutely say that gentrification and the feeling of that sense of loss of place while being emplaced where where um, you know where you belong, but the elements and the surroundings are being transformed such that you no longer feel familiar and comfortable with that place. That would absolutely be an instance that he would say this term would be uh, would be applicable to. So it's and, and in fact we thought um, you know the way that National Geographic uh, is is providing support for some of its contributors is that like in my case for instance um, I'll let the others speak if if it's of interest that you know we are always trying to thread the needle between support that's coming from the National Geographic Society and the distribution strategies of that output work in National Geographic media on the partners side of National Geographic. So the magazine and, and websites and all of that stuff. And, and we did in fact consider um, doing a component on, on gentrification. But as you mentioned, there's so many instances of this experience and of this type of transformative experience that we just could get only as far as we could. And we wanted to try to be as wide ranging, diverse, both in terms of the regions, the communities that we're visiting and in terms of like the factors of transformation. So. Ultimately, we kind of got as far as we could and hope that others will contribute um, their, own, their own stories and observations. Yeah, I wonder if I could build on John's question and ask any of the other presenters, Ian, Vic, Michael, if they want to reflect on solastalgia and their, from their lens, if they're experiencing, uh, if it resonates with you or, and if there are other ways of applying that concept. If anybody has something. I would, oh, Vic, I don't want to cut you off. Were you about to talk? I'll throw on one point. Um, I wish I knew that term when I was writing the book because I struggled to um, capture this thing I noticed among, um, especially long haul fishermen, but you know, seafarers who spend real amounts of time away from home, that they seem caught between two places. And on the one hand, they seem very much at home uh, at sea, um, as much as they might suffer abuses of various sorts. Um, and then, but when they, but they long for their family and landed life. But then when they get back to land, they feel almost in a PTSD sort of way. Um, ill-equipped to readjust to that realm and the amount of stimulation and the pace of it all and all these things, or, or you know, um, ex-offenders, you know, you know, um, seeking to readjust to life on the outside. I and mean, you can look at a lot of different communities and, and, and use that term to better capture potentially what emotionally and psychologically th they might be going through. So it's a really um, beautiful thing you've created there. Yeah. Vic, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I was gonna, I, I love this idea of soul nostalgia. Um, also, I learned a lot about nostalgia too, like where the root word comes from. It's something I always say about myself, but now nah, I know what it means. It makes even more sense. Um, but yeah, I think that this phrase of like soul nostalgia is really making me think a lot about the uprisings that are happening right now. Um, and the way that landscapes of cities are changing. I'm in Minneapolis right now. Um, my partner's from Minneapolis and we've been talking a lot about, or some a bit about how the landscape of this city in itself has changed. Um, and I'm thinking kind of about maybe tapping into soul nostalgia or creating that uncomfortability amongst people as kind of a tool to um, call attention to people who felt uncomfortable for like most of their lives. Uh, and so that's kind of what I'm thinking a lot about with this word um, and how it and what it means, definitely. So I 
that's kind of what first came to mind, just in the current context of what's going on, just how these uprisings kind of tap into that for people, um, changing the landscapes of their homes and of their communities and forcing them to really look at what's been going on. Yeah, a lot to think about there. Michael, did you want to reflect or we get? Yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing, you know, I, we had a project called the Housing is a Human Right for a while that we, what we did that was like sort of ruminated on this idea of the dignity of a place to call home. And, you know, I think what, what I'm thinking about as in relation to that provocation around sort of like breaking down words is um, this, this current moment and the ability to just have an imagination to, to like, you know, very often we think about place as just a physical place, but we don't think about the texture of relationships that really sort of constitute a place. And I think that's very relevant now when we think about this conversation around deep, defunding police, um, you know, people are like, oh, I can't imagine a world without uh, police, but it's really just a, like looking at the suburbs. And we see that where there's a subsequent investment in the texture of uh, community rather than sort of uh, this punitive mechanism. So I think that that's sort of what I was thinking about as Pete was talking about and this idea of sort of what's the sort of ethereal like layer of community that we can really invest in in a way that um, really sort of supports communities. Yeah, there's so many ways that you can apply this concept. I'm thinking with all of the attention over the last several days to the race massacre in Tulsa in 1921, the, the dislocation, the violent dislocation of that community from their place would have to be a, another dramatic example of this. I think it's a good time to switch to, uh, thank you, John, uh, for that great uh, starting question. Diane Ives has a question for us too, if we can light her up and bring her on. Thank you. Welcome back. Diane was with us just a few days ago, sharing her perspectives, uh, which build on the, the uh, essay that she wrote for our new report, Environmental Grant Making. Um, and be sure to, to tune back in and, and watch the recording of that if you missed it. But Diane, you have a question. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm with the, Diane, I'm with the Candida Fund. And I just want, I have a question, but Vic, I just want to acknowledged um, the way you kind of took that term of solastalgia and took, turned it into an organizing tool. I just think that's brilliant. So uh, I, I look forward to seeing how you're able to um, use that for your own best advantage. Um, but the question I have for you all was, um, I'm curious about what uh, is storytelling for racial and environmental justice kind of impact in organizing like in a virtual world? Anybody can answer? I'll kind of, uh, I'll go first. Um, I feel like when it comes to I don't know, virtual organizing and uh, storytelling, for sure, I think that uh, you get a lot more access to stories that you maybe wouldn't have been able to see close by. I think that's, um, I think all the potential that exists in online and virtual storytelling is really exemplified by the way that like young people use um, the internet to share lived experiences, to share stories. I think that young people a lot of the times use, um, I mean, obviously it could be like a desensitizing tool too, but I think for a lot of young people, it's a great tool to learn empathy and learn other people's stories um, because you get to be placed into other people's worlds in a ways that you've never had before. Um, I can't be sure that like I would have the platform that I have or that people would listen to me that the way that they do if I wasn't able to create an online community um, where I met other people who look like me and were able to like, where I was able to get the language to talk about the things that I care about. I think especially for um, young people uh, who hold marginalized identities, the internet is so important for storytelling and how we relate to other people. Because if you're in a community where you're not around other people who are maybe trans or Afro-Latinx or Afro-Indigenous, um, I could find those people online, even if they're not around me. And that means that I, that I can strengthen my own story through that. Um, so that's kind of my take. Great, great start there. Anybody want to add a point? And I would just throw in that, oh, Pete, you go first. Uh, you're on mute. Um, Ian, take it and he'll okay. come in. Yeah, I mean, so I, that methodological point of ensuring that you get out there becomes a bit of a problem when you can't get on a plane or a boat. Um, on the other hand, and furthermore, um, if this diaspora tribe, 56 million people, 
are of interest largely because they're transient and unusually invisible. Many of them migrant, many of them undocumented, and then geographically separated from, you know, um, anyone that would um, maybe protect them or uh, check up on them. You know, so if if this population was already invisible and inaccessible. COVID has made it 10 times worse. Um, uh, a lot of them are stranded. Um, commerce has slowed down. So there are boats, hundreds upon hundreds of boats um, that we're hearing about daily where you've got seafarers stuck and they have no idea how they're gonna get on land anywhere. Um, and so the, the problem has become very acute uh, from a storytelling point of view and the challenges of telling it. On the other hand, on the distribution side, for us at the Outlaw Ocean Project, it's been a boon, frankly, because a lot of musicians are stuck and their um, um, events are canceled and they too can't travel and they can't tour. And so they're, they've been very eager to jump on board the project. And um, so um, we've been really doing a lot of really great stuff on the distribution front, but on the journalism front, um, it's been tough. And Pete? I, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think we're, it's sort of fortunate in a way that we're living through a period right now where we're rethinking so much of what the conventional models were, their, their efficacy and their merits anyway. And I'm actually, I'm so interested. I'd love to hear Michael talk more about the turn of phrase that he used about the people formerly known as the audience. I think that's like such an interesting turn of phrase and the audience question I think is so important. But what I mean in terms of like further rethinking, I mean, we're in the midst of rethinking so many things and I think certainly related to environmental issues. I mean, I come from a kind of traditional photojournalistic background and, um, you know, I, I, something that I encountered almost immediately was my recognition as I was trying to approach this idea of like, let's try to explore something that's not as steeped in tropes and something that in a lot of cases is devoid of a lot of the things that drive the typical kind of reaction barometers, at least to photojournalistic um, images, which is drama. You know, people, people, aud audiences, however we define that, have often been either conditioned to uh, appreciate or appreciate intrinsically images, stories that follow these archetypal types of like dramas. And, uh, you know, I think particularly with issues related to incremental climate change, these are incredibly difficult. These are not, these are stories that whisper. And we have got to like, in the incremental dimensions, of course, you have acute instances, Hurricane Sandy, the fires in Paradise, California. But for the most part, we're dealing with quiet, incremental changes that are extremely real and pronounced in the, in the experiences of those that, that go through them each day. But as a communication strategy of how we relay that to audiences, I think we really need to think critically and creatively about how we're relaying these stories because the, you know, the conventional models, I don't think, cut it. It's also fascinating the way that the categories are disappearing and Ian is, you know, producing a book and articles and music and your photography is not just its own. You, you are also providing the words as well as the photos. And then your photos are incorporated into uh, Ron Howard's new movie about paradise, which just had its uh, premiere the other day. And so the, the way that these media formats are connecting and more powerful through those connections. I think Natalie Applewhite from the Pulitzer Center is gonna to add to um, Diane's uh, question. Do you wanna offer you? Yeah, I just, I mean, I'm sort of building on what both Ian and, and Pete have said um, in that, you know, there's both obviously this challenge, including, you know, we were planning on supporting Ian to do some reporting um, this spring and couldn't. Um, so obviously we've had to put a lot of things on on hold, um, but we've seen in terms of outreach around the projects that we do, this incredible growth in our audience. And we've always supported global issues, increasingly also in the United States in terms of poverty, incarceration, and other issues like that, now COVID and racial injustice, of course. Um, but there's been a gap with our between our audience and the people that we report on. And what we've been seeing in the outreach that we've been doing is this growth of these communities that are completely cross border um, and these conversations that are happening that are just really inspiring. I mean, we've been, the rainforest work we've been doing, we've been organizing seminars and webinars 
for environmental journalists working in tropical rainforest zones and the amount of engagement that we're seeing. Um, I just think, I just want to point back to the opportunity because I think, I think that may have been what Diane was getting at, that yes, these are the challenges, but you know, what are the opportunities here to actually reach new audiences and give voice to, um, or just provide channels for people that we're not normally hearing from, especially the indigenous communities um, where we report. So in terms of environmental issues. It's a great point. Rather than hear from anyone on to, to respond to that point, I do want to get to Nikita Kumar's question, uh, which she has in the Q&A that people may have already seen. She had to drop off, she told me, but I'll, I'll voice it for her. During Pete's travels, did communities and residents share what they wanted to see to end this cycle of solastalgia? I, I really appreciated Vic's point that acute events can create leaders and then start looking at the interconnections and systems-based problems, which seems like what is, is what happened with water warriors. What should media and commu communications be doing to help support that trajectory? And uh, we know you have to, we have, you have a hard stop, Pete. So if you wanna pick on that, like did anyone that you uh, met with that you, whose stories you featured, did you have any idea how to interrupt this dynamic? Um, I mean, certainly, everybody that I encountered um, that, that's living with a, a facet of their surrounding that they feel is seriously degrading their quality of life and their ability to enjoy the environment in the way that they always had, uh, wants to see whatever that impediment is to that feeling of comfort stop. Um, you know, ultimately, I think Glenn Albrecht's interest and in the sort of reverberations of this concept in various circles you know, he feels fundamentally that unless something has a name, we cannot truly recognize its prevalence. You know, it's sort of this ambient part of the atmosphere until we, we give it a name, which signals some kind of collective recognition of, of its existence. Yeah. But ultimately, his ambition is to, you know, there's, there's a certain irony in like, listen, I think we're getting to a point where this experience is prevalent enough for enough people that there needs to be a sense of connectivity so that people can organize and address these issues and ultimately end the thing that is you know had been prior to his his initiatives unnamed like can we get it to a point where we don't need to talk about it anymore you know he's like naming this phenomenon that unfortunately seems to be uh you know rising in a considerable way throughout the world but ultimately his hope is that naming of it ultimately brings about its reduction in a funny yeah. way and you just touched on it at the end of your presentation but you're really exploring how covid is creating the dislocation in all of our lives. So maybe we will all have a, a, a better ability to empathize with those stark cases because we have all experienced that kind of dislocation too. Well, I think that's, and I'll say very briefly that, you know, what I, I could send around this article that I, that I wrote that accompanied those series of pictures. Um, but really what I said in there was that as I set out to try to under, better understand uh, Albrecht's concept of this, which he really focuses on the physical dimensions of things. I, I can't recall who, who, who precisely mentioned earlier, like these built environments ultimately are, I think perhaps it was Michael, these are the stages, of course, for all of the interconnections of our personal social lives. And what I thought was so interesting about COVID, like as I talked to more people living in the midst of major environmental transformation, the facet of distress that stood out most in my, my findings was the social dimension. Okay, this physical transformation is underway, but what cuts the deepest is the way that it undermines the, the sense of community cohesion. Yeah. And that felt to me like, a, like, like <clears throat> COVID was like skipping steps. Okay, we didn't necessarily have physical transformation of the landscapes around us, but all of that social culture that so many of us rely on and, and, and gives us that sense of inclusion was just immediately undermined. And that just felt like some small window. I'm not saying it's comparable, but it felt like some small window through which we could get some sense of what an inhospitable environment might mean to us at that level. We will provide a link to the article in the follow-up materials for all of this and for the recording that people will get. And if you have to drop off, that's fine too. But I wanna, I know we're over time, but I wanna give anybody else a chance to respond to Nikita's question about what can we do about this? I mean such a powerful starting point that Pete has given us. Any, uh, anyone want to offer, Michael? I see your mic is up. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the things we, res we um, I wrestle with uh, addressing the, both the distress and I think um, some of the things that are raised by Diane's question about this sort of this digital space um, is it's empathy isn't enough. 
but there is this other piece of like, how do we demonstrate people's ability to have agency in the scenario, both themselves and the people around them? Um, because that's a critical piece of the conversation um, that I think we can talk more about to be able to, to address this sort of like the, the distress of this existential crisis. I also think there's this other piece that I worry about as it relates to Diane's question, but particularly addressing this distress is the curation of media. So I think, you know, I definitely am, you know, a, a maker, an artist and a journalist who's really benefited in some ways, you know, like I, I joke, I was fired uh, twice from the Village Voice, um, only because they got bought and restructured and like moved the photo department to interns. But in some ways that like forced me to be creative about this sort of like um, ways that we can harness the fragmentation of media. For, but in that, I also worry about the confirmation bias that's happening in that media landscape where we're just getting what we already know and like aren't introduced. And I'm not the type of person who's always like, oh, we need to like always bridge the chorus because I do think the chorus needs to eat. And part of the chorus's nourishment is being able to be introduced to sort of new ideas that challenge their own understanding, right? And I feel like, at least in what I've experienced, and I worked on this project with Naomi Klein um, uh, as an impact producer for the film, this changes everything. And so what I saw that people were breaking out of that distress was when they could be sort of engaged in real life with different ideas and really engaged in sort of a series of dialectics that allowed them to sort of deepen their own understanding of their own perception, but also understand where other people were coming from. And I feel like so much of the political polarization we're experiencing where people are just like, oh, you over there, you don't know because X, Y, Z, there's the assumption that they're an idiot or that they're dumb and they just haven't really seen the truth that my side knows, right? And so like, that's what I worry about, sort of like the fragmentation really exacerbating. And I feel like mm -hmm. if we, it, like it's a, it's a space in the media landscape that could use more um, investment around how do we invest in sort of programmatic and curatorial prerogatives that really bring lots of ideas together to really, so we can really appreciate where people are coming from. And I feel like that's something that it can help us navigate that sort of existential. That's a great point. Um, I do want to give Vic a chance to jump in here too, and then we'll probably wrap. Yeah, um, I was just going to say when the question of what should media and communications be doing to help support the trajectory of people becoming leaders um, out of these moments, I think that I see, especially in kind of like impact media, I see, I see a lot of media that teaches people about their privilege by showing the like trauma and stories of black and brown people where we lack privilege. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for more media to be made for white allies in a way that doesn't necessarily frame the story of like marginalized communities. Like, look, these are people that are struggling and they need help, but instead frames it about actually teaching people about what their privilege is and what it does um, without having to kind of like put on display um, all the day-to-day -day difficulties that come with being a person of color or a marginalized person. I think there's a lot of opportunity for more media that focuses on allies um, and creating allies in the white community and in privileged and in privileged communities in general, um, without having to kind of put trauma on full display. We should probably hear more about that, um, but I I don't think we have a a lot more time today since we're already over time. Ian, did you want to offer any uh, observation on that last point? Um. No, I mean, I think I think um, all three, Pete, Mike, um, and Vic, really touched on um, systemic um, change through journalism. I think in my own work, um, I what Michael was saying, I think um, hit a note with me in that um, pausing. You're writing a five thousand word piece for the New Yorker, and before you file it to your editor, you stop and think have I done right by the people I disagree with in this piece? And even and often the, that demographic in your own story won't engage with you. They, they won't answer your calls. And so you actually have to channel their perspective without them sometimes. And, um, and that sense of duty is one of the methodological things that I think us in journalism have to not forget about because that runs us into the very problem that Michael was identifying. Um, and um, in each individual product that we put out, um, does some work towards explaining perspectives, be they marginalized communities, 
um, or non-marginalized communities, but really trying to, um, from an explanatory perspective, understanding um, things, um, even for those that won't engage with you. Um, so that's just one thing that I think um, uh, is a change factor in how you do long form narrative journalism. Um, so that I'll just stop there with that. It's a, it's a great place to land. And Tim, did you have any uh, final thoughts you wanted to share? No, just a, a, a word of gratitude and with a lot of humility, thank you to everyone for sharing your stories and thoughts with us today. Yeah, I would echo that. And thanks to Caitlin, who seems to have had to drop off and to everyone for giving us a little extra time uh, for such a rich discussion. I think we were all enriched by this experience. I want to thank Ian and Michael and Pete and Vic for bringing these stories to us, sharing them, and hopefully we can really do something with this knowledge and, and construct even more powerful support for, for you and all the people who are um, being highlighted in these stories. Thank you all. At the end of this process, if you can stay on for the, for the, the, the link that gives you a prompt to do the short survey, we'd appreciate that. Uh, but otherwise, um, uh, hope to see more of you on the next program on Thursday. And that'll be the final program. But thank you all speakers for today's. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Vic. Thank you.